Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Hi, I'd like to introduce Bill Mathis to our interview show of All Things LGBTQ. Hi, Bill, how are you today? Good afternoon, I'm fine. Good. Snow out where you are? We got about a half inch. Yeah, we have a dusting. Um, so I'm going to read your bio so that our audience will have at least a head, uh, an idea about what you do and what you're writing. So Bill Mathis is a PK, which I've never heard, um, <laughs> a preacher's kid from Clarksville, Michigan. He directed YMCA camps in Illinois and Illinois and Michigan for 23 years and helped open and direct a foster care agency until he retired in 2013, after which he began to write. Bill is the writer, Bill is the winner of the Chicago Writers Association 2019 first chapter contest and the recipient of the 2009 Pen Craft Runner Up Award for Literary Excellence. He currently lives in Southern Wisconsin with his partner, where he volunteers with hospice and enjoys traveling, reading, and photography. So I see from your background that photography might be another interest of yours. Uh, yes. Exciting. Yes. Um, going to have a book of photography at some point, or is it uh, no. for a hobby? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bill, your recent book is Revenge is Necessary. So um, could you give us a little bit of an introduction to the book and perhaps read a small part so the audience can get an idea about the book you're writing? Are you sure. I'd love to. Uh, Revenge is Necessary is set in southwestern Minnesota in the farm fields, the corn and soybean fields. It involves a large farm family of a very successful farmer um, who wake up one morning to the beginning realization that their father, husband, father uh, is not who they thought he was. And the, I'll read the first chapter, which really sucks you in. But the idea is um, sort of, of realizing you've lived your life with a psychopath and didn't know it. <laughs> so there's, there's family secrets that just keep unrolling. And uh, the wife has won, and she thought that's what this was about. But uh, it wasn't. It turns out that he had many secrets and he'd known hers and was seeking revenge very patiently. And then it gradually unlayers in, into the fact of how he acquired the amount of farms he owns and the land he controls. Um, uh, so he wasn't who, he th who, who they thought he was. And the guy was 73 years old or something like that. But um, so it, it deals with, yeah, it deals with several things. He, he chooses to, uh, to allow a gun injury to, to, to die from it rather than uh, have his leg amputated. So there, there's all kinds of choices that are made that, that are interesting. But the, uh, the LGBTQ part is there's several characters. The farmer's son, the youngest kid of seven, um, is gay and his friend and they're involved. And then the, uh, the, uh, the there's two adults, men who, who are meet. So there, there's a little bit of a romance side story to in it. Um, but, but it, it's mostly kind of a psychological thriller and surprises that just keep unfolding. So let me read the uh, first chapter here. <clears throat> It's Revenge is Necessary, Chapter One, Junior. And the book is written in viewpoints of five or six characters. So Junior is Shaw Phillips Gogman Jr. He's 17, almost 18. It's Saturday, March 26, 2011. 
and it's in a fictional town of Midville, Minnesota, which is near the real towns of uh, Worthington and, and Marshall. Junior ran faster, his bare feet churning, sinking into the dirt drive, already muddy from three days of rain and now topped with three inches of heavy, wet, late March snow. The grainy flakes whirled around him, pelting his skin, nearly blinding him. He didn't feel the cold yet. Where was he headed? Where could he go in his fruit of the loom white t-shirt and tidy whiteies at seven on a Saturday morning? His, his dad might come after him at his dad might come after him if he headed toward his boyfriend Beanie's house. The image of his father with a double barrel shotgun bursting in on him and Beanie in Junior's bed pulsed with every heartbeat. Beanie's words as Junior raced toward the door still echoed, run, Forrest, run. The same, wor the same words his mother screamed at his track meets. She loved the movie, Forrest Gump. He knew Beanie escaped down the back stairs as Junior flew down the front ones. Beanie would be, be well on his way home. He was a fast runner too. At least he had a place to go to for sanctuary. Damn Beanie, sneaking into Junior's bedroom in the early morning or middle of the night, still dressed, crawling into Junior's bed, ignoring the twin guest bed in the room, the bed his mother moved in over 10 years ago when Beanie started showing up in the middle of the night, coming in the unlocked back door, slipping up the narrow back stairway and into Junior's room without making a sound. What caused his father to lose his marbles? Completely lose them. It's not like Beanie never slept over before. Right, Junior, duck right. His mother's scream sounding from the front porch broke his thoughts, made his heart thump harder. How could he be thinking about his bedroom and Beanie when his father at this very second must have the shotgun aimed at him? He dodged right closer to the overgrown shrubs that lined the quarter mile driveway. He heard the shotgun bellow and felt sharp stings on his left buttock along the back of his upper leg. He ran faster, tried to crouch lower, birdshot. At least it was birdshot. It smarted, but he was far enough to realize it couldn't go deep. He must have, it must have caught the edge of the pattern. He dodged into the middle of the drive and quickly back to the right. Did that several times. Why? He wasn't sure. Maybe zigzagging would make it harder for his dad to focus on a moving target. He knew what was in the other barrel of the gun, a slug. That would more than sting if it hit him. It would kill him. His dad was a good shot. His mother's scream again tore through the wet, thick air. No words. It was followed by the shotgun blasting his skin and his dad bellowing. Was he in pain? Did he still have the gun? Did he have more shells? Junior threw himself into the ditch and lay in the cold, sloppy mud and snow. Hearing nothing, no sound of a thud or a slug whistling by, he stood, turned and took several cautious steps toward the house. His mother's voice floated toward him through the heavy swirling snow. It was less shrill, but still urgent. Her don't mess with me voice. You're safe for now, keep running, don't come home. <clears throat> what the hell did that mean? You're safe, keep running, but don't come home. He turned, lengthened his stride and settled into the 800 meter pace he ran for track. He sensed the front of a soaked t-shirt invading his nighttime warmth, but still he didn't feel the cold. He stayed to the right of the drive on the edge, the grass slippery beneath the snow. At 127th Street, he wanted to turn left, run one quarter mile to Millican Road and go left a half mile to Beanie's house. However, if he, figure, he figured if his dad was still capable, he might jump into his truck and head toward Beanie's house down their Millican Road driveway. If he shot at him once, wouldn't he shoot again? Junior remembered his father's words in the bedroom as he aimed the shotgun at him. You're not my son. What did that mean? Junior turned right onto 127th Street. A half mile further was the small Lutheran church and cemetery or someone might be around and let him in. Why didn't he hear his dad's diesel pickup starting up? His dad must have ignored Beanie, who was probably home by now. Would he has, or his mom call 911? Would his dad show up at Beanie's looking for him? His feet began to sense the cold and the occasional small stone. He was glad the road was mostly dirt, not all gravel. 
How long did it take to get frostbite? He was approaching the fence of the cemetery when he heard a vehicle slowly splashing behind him. He glanced back. It wasn't his dad's pickup. Junior slowed to a walk as the old pickup eased to a stop beside him. He glanced in and saw Jens Hansen motioning for him to climb in. There was a tarp covering something in the back end. It was shaped like a casket. Junior opened the door and slid into the warmth. He grabbed the blanket on the seat and pulled it around him like it was the last one on earth. That's the end of first chapter. That's great. <laughs> so I'll have to get my order in so I can read. Um, it really does pull you in. Um, and uh, is this it? So you would consider this like sort of thriller? Um, yeah, I call it kind of a psychological thriller. It uh huh. Thrillers have, you know, lots of really scary stuff. And, and this isn't so much that, it's more the psychological. It's the, what would cause a, a, a man and a husband to uh, go after his son and tell him he's not his son. And then the, the, you'll learn in shortly that he turned, he turned the gun on his wife and said, you're next. Um, <laughs> So all in the beginning, so I can't imagine what goes on. <laughs> so it just kind of like it's in layers. It just unravels. <laughs> so are your other books in the same vein? Um, no, no. Okay. My first book, Face Your Fears, is actually a coming of age book by a disabled quadriplegic cerebral palsy kid who who comes out as gay and, and eventually meets somebody um and falls in love as as an adult but it's uh it's the story of the two lives of the two men who eventually meet later in the book but it's it, it really is dealing with the fact that disabled people can be gay um or uh queer and uh so it kind of shatters a lot of, of stereotypes um and then the the second book my second book the rooming house diaries Life, Love, and Secrets, there's always secrets, um, is, it, it is uh, actually historical fiction. And it's the story that centers around an old rooming house on the south side of Chicago near the stockyards. And it actually is five or six, their diaries, they're really stories, are found with a, with a lot of photographs in this old rooming house and it covers the story of the original owners lives in starting in Poland in the 1880s and coming to Chicago and then their family and the families that lived in the rooming house um, and and so it, it's a cast of characters um, and then the, the rooming house gallery it doesn't continue the stories but picks up with the young gay couple that inherited the old rooming house and their attempt at converting it into a gallery and, and starting a family and all kinds of things. So. Great. And we'll have the, your um, website and everything under the interview so that, and also on our um, webpage so that anybody who wants to buy your books, they'll know where to look for them. Great. Uh, and and um, so, you started writing a little later in life than maybe some people do. Um, were you always interested in writing? Did you write as a youth? Well, uh, I was interested as a youth in high school, I was interested in journalism. And so I went to college originally just to get an associate's degree in journalism and then go become the next great life or look magazine photojournalist and travel the world. When, when you grow up in a town of 365 people, you know, you dream big. Um, and, and along the way that burned out in the Vietnam War. So I stayed in college and got a degree in business and then fell into the YMCA. Um, so I had the journalism background. I have one of my degrees is as an associates in, in journalism. And um, so with the camps and the nonprofits, I wrote brochures and flyers and took our publicity pictures. But that, that was about it. I, I didn't think of writing a book or writing much. Um, and then when I retired uh, um, 
full disclosure, I was married and divorced twice. I'm a late learner. That's why I started writing late. Um, I came out as gay in my early 60s. And um, I met this guy about the time I retired and ended up moving in with him here in Beloit, Wisconsin. And after a couple months, he says, well, you just can't follow me around. Um, go find something to do. And so the uh, Beloit College, which is across the street from us, um, offered a writing class for old people, for senior citizens. And so I signed up and took it and was hooked. That, that was the start of it. Um, and so I didn't start writing a book, right? Or I, I did start writing short stories and then tried to do a, a memoir and then kind of got frozen on that and switched to fiction and realized I can make up a lot of things with fiction. <laughs> So in any of your stories, I, I know you're um, from the Midwest. Right. Um, were, you, were you a farm family in addition to being a minister's or a preacher's son? Yeah, PK, preacher's kid. Yes. Yeah. My, my parents actually farmed. Uh, I was born when they were still farming. Um, but then they got saved and were born again Christians and went to Bible school and became a pastor. And my dad is 94, almost 94, and he's pastoring with a nursing home now as soon as they let him back in after COVID. Um, so he, he, he now stands outside the windows and talks to him on the phone and prays with him or whatever. But um, so they were farmers. My mom's family was farmers. I used to spend time down at my grandparents' farm the town we grew up in, Clarksville, Michigan, is a tiny town surrounded by farms. And so I've bucked bales, I've shoveled manure, I've cleaned out stalls, I've driven tractor, trucks, um, I, enough to know it wasn't for me, but I sure respect farmers. Yeah. Um, so, so I have a good, a lot of my, a lot of the, the kids I grew up with and high school kids, uh, all, a lot of them, many of them came from farm families. So. And so what's next for you in terms of? Well, as what's next, um, I have a book in process um, that, that is at the publishers and it's called Memory Tree. And it actually deals with a mixed race couple in Michigan, um, rural Michigan. And uh, it, it's narr partly narrated by the stardust, I call stardust, the spirit of the little girl who died and uh, was murdered. And so it, it's... Um, I think it's interesting, but I think everything I write is interesting. <laughs> um, so it, it really is dealing with um, racial issues, but but also um, not life after death, but it kind of takes a different look at that too, so. Okay. Um, and I imagine you're just going to keep going and going until you. Well, I, I've kind of I've hit a lull right now. I I've, I was 22 or 23 years ago. I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, and so I, my energy level rises and lowers. And I don't know if it's been due to the pandemic or everything, but man, this last six months it's it's been really hard to write anything new. So I've been revising stuff and trying to do some promotion. And but I have I I have. I have another book in progress um, that I'm just going very slowly on and then idea for, for another one, a spinoff from the, the memory tree, so. I think it's, you know, for me, writing or doing anything, it's, it's even reading, it's, it's harder to concentrate during the wow. pandemic. I think yeah. this is, and, and of course, the presidency in the country and, but, um, you know, there's this sort of overlay that's really hard to, pull yourself out of sometimes. So I totally get it. Um, so what do you enjoy reading besides, I mean, are you a thriller reader or do you read romance or? I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very eclectic. 
once you get into writing, you you meet all these other authors that are writing. And so I, I think half of writing a book and selling books is just selling them to other authors and reading theirs. <laughs> but it kind of becomes a cult, you know. So uh, um, I, I'm fairly eclectic in what I read. I used to years ago, I, I've always been a reader, read lots of biographies. Um, different things. I read a little bit of Stephen King, um, but but it varies. Some, the, the, the author I'm really into right now is Kazuo Ishiguro, Ishiguro. I'm not sure how to pronounce it right, but I'm on his on, on a book, one of his, the third book, and he's written many now. And, and he, he, he just creates these seemingly uh, logical normal worlds and they're not <laughs> and, and some of them are historical and some of them are more current and um and, and but I, I i've really enjoyed reading him lately and he's been somebody i can read all the way through but other books you know stones from the river by ursula heggie and and uh um the paying guests and, and some of those have all been favorites um so I, I keep a stack up here on my bookshelf on the top of the bookcase. If it makes it up there, it's I've loved it. And then I, I read a lot on Kindle also. So. And so I have one last question for you before we go. And that's like, you know, just sort of a fun question of like you're sitting in a bar and you're having a beer and everything's really cool. And if you could imagine three living or dead people writers coming or anybody poets uh musicians coming in to sit down with you and have a chat who would they be well i'll, I'll tell you the, the first one and this is simply because it's so uh prevalent in my mind is ishiguro ishiguro um i i would love to pick his brain and how he writes um the way he does because his style of writing is just very different um but but it's marvelous. So that would be one person. Um, uh, I, let me look at my books. Oh, the other one I would love to talk to a little bit would be Carol Rifka Brunt. And she wrote it. It's more of a uh, YA book, but it's certainly for adults. Um, Tell the Wolves I'm Home. And, and it, it's another story that just layers. I love these stories that come at you in layers as, as you read deeper. So those would be a couple of people I'd like to sit in a bar with and chat with, so. That's great. Um, so Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show. And when you get your new book coming out, which I'm sure it will, let us know and we'll have you on to discuss that book. Great. And um, take care, be safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Great, thank you. Take care. As people may have noticed on uh, recurring interviews on all things LGBTQ, we've taken this opportunity with the option of using Zoom to visit those parts of our state that we might have been overlooking. You know, there is a lot of organizing that is happening here in Vermont. And we want to ensure that people realize what's happening in their backyard. So for today, we're going to Rutland. And I want to introduce Carly, who is one of the primary organizers in Rutland right now. Welcome, Carly. Thanks for having me, Keith. Nice to be here. Oh, and, and we're very thankful that, one, for the organizing you're doing in Rutland, and you could make time to join us. So I want to start with Rutland. How did you happen to come to be in Rutland? Well, I'm a native Rut Rut Rutlander. I was uh, born in Rutland and uh, went through elementary and high school here in Rutland. Um, I've been lived in Vermont the majority of my life. So um, after uh, going to college in a couple of different places, I came back to Rutland uh, 14 years ago and been here pretty much ever since. Um, I just, that's how I found my way to Rutland. So it's just, you know, near and dear to my heart. My family's here and I'm a, I'm a Rutlander at heart. All right. So, but 
we have a lot of people who are sort of natives, but they don't become activists. They don't become organizers in their communities. What prompted you to start organizing within the LGBTQ plus community in Rutland? And what were the challenges you encountered trying to do that? Well, just a little tiny background about me. I've always worked at volunteering and organizing all throughout starting in college and then moving on into my adult life. I've always been a volunteer. Um, I, I decided to start um, organizing in Rutland when um, people just it seemed like there was a need for it. And um, when I joined the um, LGBTQIA meetup group that was back in 2017, um, I started to see that, you know, the need for uh, LGBTQ community and socializing was really important to this area because I'd meet a lot of people who said, I don't, I'm not finding anything here. So um, I think that's just how I decided to start working for Rutland and trying to get Rutland, Rutland's community going. So this was an extension of your personal sense of connection with the community. Meetup, that's a social network. Yeah, meetup.com. It's a it's a place where people can log on and make different social groups to do do these things called meetups. That's what they call them, and um, just basically social events. Uh, we did lots of different things. We you know meet up at a bar for drinks one night. We would have um, recurring a social event called Social Sundays where we'd all get together for coffee once a month at a local coffee shop. We had some pancake brunches. We went through the corn maze. It was very, mainly social, but it was just a way to connect LGBT community community in the Rutland area. So if I was somebody who had joined versus meetup, would I have been also participating in creating those social networks, make it, making the suggestions that, oh, I would like to do this, or, or, or how did those events come into being? Um, I planned a lot of them myself, to be honest with you, Keith. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, I'd have ideas. I got a lot of input from, we had a great meeting um, back in um, 2018. Uh, there was a large group of, that came together at that time and we really found the need for um, LGBT community in this area. So uh, we did a lot of brainstorming about what people would like to see in Rutland. And so from that list we had compiled, I would work from it and create things that people seem to be interested in doing in the Rutland area. So. How many people did you end up bringing in via the Meetup social app? Well, we finally, we were on the Meetup social app for um, two years and um, the, that group grew, grew to about 285 people um, when we were still in Meetup. So that became quite a, a big group of people who, um, you know, enjoyed our group and not saying that, uh, you know, there was a tremendous amount of participation in the events I did and that was one of the challenges is as a as a leader you create events and then you see who will come but I did meet a lot of interesting people over the years and um it was just really great just to you know people would say and especially people who come from uh different locations that were far away people came from White River Junction I had people coming up from um near Albany up to Rutland just because that lack of community in the central you know sort of central southwest Vermont and even into New York was very um very much lacking so I had people from all over come to my events okay you're talking about it in the past tense so I'm taking it that the meetup process has ended you're yeah. no longer utilizing it I'm no longer utilizing Meetup. We're mainly a Facebook group right now, and um, now we're connected with Queer, Queer Connect. So that's a whole nother uh, chapter in this uh, organizing that I've been working on for the last couple of months. And um, that's a real exciting thing that we're doing right now, Queer Connect. So um, this is a whole new chapter for the Rutland group. I was going to say, and, and that takes me right into where I was going to go next, which is, okay, so if, if Meetup, is no longer the venue. What has replaced it? So you have a Facebook page, and it, yep. it and it's publicly listed. So if we put the Facebook address up, people would be able to access it. They will be. Yep. Um, yep. It's uh, the what I'd like to announce today, just so we can get get this out here, is um, 
you know, Rutland, uh, the Rutland LGBTQIA group, which is what I've been calling my group over the last couple of years, is now officially the Rutland branch of Queer Connect. Yay! <laughs> so um, that's a really great partnership that um, I've tried to cultivate over the last six months. Um, I met Lisa Carton from Queer Connect last spring um, when one of her pride planning meetings, and uh, we've just been working together closely. And um, now um, we're going. It's going to take a little time for us to get everything ironed out, but we're now the Rutland branch of Queer Connect. So it's very exciting, and I think it's going to be a great step to be part of the nonprofit. And um, work together just to create community in southwestern Vermont. Okay, so you're going to benefit by some of the work that Queer Connect Bennington has already done. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to ask you next is what are the unique events that you want to or that the new organization would like to create specifically for Rutland? I mean, Rutland has its own challenges. I mean, I know there's a lot, I mean, there's been news about Rutland over the years. I mean, we've had some trouble with um, a, you know, the problem of the problems of addiction in Rutland City. Um, but there's a lot of great community organizations here that have done a lot of strides to make sure, make our community more safe and, you know, make our communities a place where people want to be and not afraid of Rutland. So um, I'm striving to make uh, Queer Connect Rutland, a community organization, not only just for social events. So this is where I'm kind of transitioning a little bit to something different, but not just for social events, but a real community organization to have resources. Um, we've made connections with Outright Vermont and uh, different community organizations in Rutland, um, whether it be Project Vision. Um, and we're just making all sorts of different connections to really make this a, a true community organization going forward. So I will tell you, and, and I shared some of this with you prior to our starting the actual taping, is that as somebody who had grown up here in Vermont, that Rutland's always seemed to be a difficult community for LGBTQ plus people to break into. What has and from having grown up there, your your experience may have been slightly different, but what has been the community response to, to the organizing and the public events that you've already held? Well, I mean, things have really, I mean, things have really taken off in the last year, Keith. I mean, this has been the most growth year for our group in many different ways. I mean, the word of mouth is um, really taking off. Um, there's been a couple of people that have been really instrumental in helping me with this, Lisa Carton being one of them, but also um, Jeanette Langston. She uh, is a local community organizer and she and I have been collaborating on, um, you know, just reaching out to community organizations and making this a really great place for, you know, queer people in, in the Rutland area. That, that all sounds, incredibly encouraging and reaffirming that the work we started way back in the 80s to try and create a, a social environment where LGBTQ plus people would be welcomed and would feel included sounds like it's happening. Now, you're, you are collaborating with Queer Connect. So if I go on to the Queer Connect, website there will be a Rutland and a Bennington listing all on the same site? Yes you can reach us through the 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 uh, Queer Connect the Queer Connect page through Facebook there will be a separate Rutland group under the you know the main Queer Connect page but there'll be a separate Rutland Queer Connect group um, it's in the works so I think by the time this airs it'll be it'll be live for everybody so we'll have that information and you can log on to our group. Um, and you can also reach us through our email address, which will also be provided to um, anyone watching out there who wants to get connected with the Rutland group and um, the exciting things we have happening in Rutland. That sounds, that sounds that sounds like the change that we've all been hoping for. And so where I want to leave our interview, other than saying thank you for the work you're doing, is I understand you're in the process of trying to organize Rutland's first Pride Day event. Mm -hmm. Now, 
since I'm one of those people who have been known to, you know, like to dress up and walk in parades, can you tell me a little bit about what you're envisioning and how people could become involved in that specific project? Well, right now, because, you know, it is COVID times, you know, we can't have traditional, um, you know, mass social gatherings for Pride, but um, the two main events we have planned for this, for June of 2021, uh, um, for first, Rutland's first historic Pride will be our, our car caravan, which will take place on June 26th. Um, and that there would be tons of more details coming out about that. We're also planning on um, working very hard to create a reverse parade through downtown Rutland, where we'll have floats that stay stationary and then people driving through the uh, parade. Um, so that's, we can keep that socially distanced and that's another project we're working on. Another small thing we're trying to do is just to um, work to erect pride flags um, on all the flagpoles in downtown Rutland throughout the month of June. So that's another pride thing. I mean, my, my take on this is I rather have a few quality events for Rutland this year and say we did a great job than to try to over plan and, you know, not get too far. So I'm trying to keep it very uh, concise, but um, very quality and hopefully just showcase the pride that I know Rutland has and we really need to showcase here. I'll, I'll, I'll start decorating my car now. <laughs> awesome, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to bringing you back to okay, do great. annual reviews of what's been happening, and we, we will promote the events in Rutland under the events section of our, our show. So thank you, Carly. Thank you, Keith. Thanks so much for having me. I'm here with our first international guest, Natalia Borges Paleso. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Van. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by giving you a little bio. Natalia Borges Paleso is from Bento Gonzalves. Would you pronounce that? I know I have it wrong. Gonzalves. That's right. Gonzalves. Oh, Bento okay. Gonzalves. Very good. In Brazil. She's a writer and translator with a PhD in literary theory. She's the author of Cutouts for Photo Album Without People, which came out in 2013. Amora, 2015, translated into English and the subject of part of our interview today. Um, in 2016, Amora won the Djibouti Award and the Djibouti Amazon Reader's Choice Award. The Book of the Year AGES Award, A-G-E-S, and the Acorianos Literature Award. She's also the author of Control, which came out in 2019, among other titles. In 2017, Natalia was one of two Brazilian authors on the Bogota 39 list, which selects the most promising Latin American authors under 39. Congratulations on all your accomplishments so far. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I guess the first question I'll have to start with, although it's kind of an interview cliche at this point, but how are you holding up in the pandemic? Um, well, now better than I expected and better than when it all started, but still, trying to manage my mental health with the, my body health and everything. It's kind of, it's hard. It's, it's something that I'm learning, but it's nice. I, I'm a person that likes to exercise a lot. So now in the context, we can't. And this is, this is being some, some kind, somehow difficult to me, but I'm holding up. Work is fine and and I have my partner and my cats, so that's what great. What you need? Yeah. Do you find that uh, a lot of people are distracted? And I struggle with that sometimes. A lot of it though is all the turmoil in the US, all the political turmoil. It's hard to pay attention to things that are maybe more important than the mm -hmm. moment. But do you find that the pandemic has affected your writing? Uh, at first, this was a very, 
last year was a very weird, strange year for me because when it started, I couldn't, before the pandemic even, I couldn't read or, or write. I was kind of in a drought period, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I, I was like, what's happening? And then everything started and it was, well, I think Brazil and US had kind of the same situation with, with the government, federal government. So that, that was kind of heavy until we understand how we had to, to move and what to do. So, uh, and also I'm a very practical and pragmatic person. So I thought, okay, I have to continue doing my work. So all the classes, all the classes, no, the classes I give at the university uh, migrate to online. That was kind of difficult, but it was okay. And then I started to translate and everything kind of consumed my creativity. So I think I, I just came back to writing maybe, maybe, maybe in August or July last year, I was revising uh, a new book, but it was kind of difficult. So it, at first I thought it, it hadn't affected me at all because I, I managed to, to change all my life and, and thing, but, but it did. But just now I can see that. Just now I can realize. I guess people get through it. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting through it, most of us anyway. Um, yeah, I guess it's more important at that point just to move to move forward. Exactly. Is there a particular writing schedule that you have? I'm a morning person, so uh, I love to wake up early. And when I say early, I mean five, five thirty or six in the morning. But my body just wakes up at this time. I don't do anything to. I don't have to to make an effort. I really go to bed early and I wake up early. So I, I like to wake up early, make some coffee, pet my cats a little bit, and then go and write. That's my favorite time. I'm not the kind of writer who would take a glass of wine and write all through the night. I can't do that. If I get a glass of, of wine, it would be to talk to my partner <laughs> or to enjoy something, not to write. That makes sense. How how long do you write usually in the morning? Every morning? I I try to to do this every morning, or I'm translating, or I'm writing, or I am doing something. Uh, but it, um, yeah, every morning I do that. But it's not not that I always have something, a project to work on. Sometimes I'm just. I don't know, thinking about things that I might write in the future. Today I had an idea when Alexa just uh, gave me some recommendations that I didn't want and then I had this idea to write about and then I took notes. So every, all, all day long I, I'm, I have those. Currently I'm using all of those. <laughs> so I take notes and everything. Um. How would you define lesbian fiction? Oh, now is the long answer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to uh, I'll have to go back a little bit to for to contextualize this um, how I get to to think about that. When I published Amora, uh, I I took this decision, I made this decision of writing women, lesbian or bisexual women characters. That was something that was decided when I, when I started the book as a, as a project. And okay, it was published, people started reading it. Um, it received some uh, good reviews on newspapers and everything, the prizes, and then a very, a very nice, professor of mine at the university asked me very innocently one day, so now that you have already written about lesbians, what are you going to write about so you don't repeat yourself? And then I was, 
<laughs> not sure if, if, if this is how it works, but this was a very interesting question because it made me think that um, uh, I, I couldn't answer her at the moment, but then I thought, I don't write about lesbians. I write with them. I write with the characters. I think about the characters and then they go whatever, whatever they want. They do whatever they have to do to the plot. So, for example, I don't know. People say that uh, Amora is a lesbian theme, has a lesbian theme. I don't think so. I think it has lesbian characters and it talks about lots of, of things, uh, not about lesbians. So, what, so uh, when people started to talk, to ask about my references and everything, I had to, to start researching uh, because, you know, I grew up, I was born in the 80s, grew up in the 90s and the, the internet access didn't, internet didn't exist where I lived yet, just in the 2000s. And search for these references was, was kind of hard. So you had to, someone had to give you the book or something like that, or, or tell you about something. It was much more difficult. And Amora is the product of the lack of references more, uh, more than the product of references that I had. So all of these things made me, made me think. And then I, I got to my postdoctoral project, which was, well, maybe I, I will have to, to see what lesbian writers are writing so I can say what lesbian literature or lesbian fiction is. And then I started this, this project called, that we can talk about later, that is Lesbian Geographies. And <coughs> one of, of my aims, my objectives, is to map worldwide these writers and to have a, a little profile, some links where you can find their work. And well, I started the project with 25 writers. Now I have more than 500 I had to stop because I have to finish the, the work and it's impossible to I know it's a, a work that I will <coughs> that I will continue doing this archive but many more many more many other people are doing that so I discovered that lesbian <laughs> fiction or lesbian literature has many faces is really plural and for me my interest as as a writer is to always have lesbian characters this is what it is about if the sexuality is an issue in the story that's that's something else but having lesbian characters for me is the most powerful thing that i can connect to lesbian uh, literature but this is for me because the other the other authors this I don't know, not, currently there are 280 Brazilian authors writing lesbian poetry, fiction and whatever, and they write about everything. <laughs> they write about family, they write about, I don't know, um, orishas or something like that, or they're, they're anyway. Um, so it's hard to say. I, I think now it's plural, it's diverse, and that's really good because as I told you, in the beginning of the 2000s, I didn't have as much references. And now I have this new world where these authors can give me their perspective of being a lesbian in the world. In, there are many, many, many ways of doing that. So I'm well, not sure if I objectively answered that. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I love the topic. And it comes up all the time in book yeah. classes. Um, one of the strengths of Amora, I think, is that it considers lesbians in all different contexts and all different kinds of lesbians, including older lesbians and bar yeah. lesbians. Um, and so we haven't, uh, the time has flown by, and I was wondering if we could close with your doing a little reading from Amora. Sure. Sure, you can do that. So um, I'm reading a part of 
um, of this short story called Flor, which is about this little girl that lives um, across lives across no lives between two service uh, mechanic service. Uh, uh, how do you say that service mechanic auto service mechanic? Yeah, yeah. And then there is this uh, this person that she service stations. Yeah, I'm... maybe. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, there is this this person that um, she doesn't know what this person is. If she's a woman, if she's a if she's a man, and she hears this word machoha, which is a very offensive word, um, and she tries the whole story. She tries to find out what the machoha is, and she is given the most absurd answers, like "Oh, it's a disease. You shouldn't talk about that," and everything. And finally, she she asks her friend to explain what a mashoha is. So let me just find them. Okay, so this is um, this narrator and uh, her friend, they are eight and 12 and they are, tr she's trying to explain it, so. Um, I'm sorry. I uh, actually, uh, I asked Siloe about it, about Flor, no caso, uh, the next day, and told her about the sickness. Siloe rolled her eyes the way people do when they are accusing someone of being naive, said nothing, took me by the hand into her room, then grabbed a teddy bear and two Barbies. Okay, so they weren't real Barbies, they were knockoffs, but they were affordable and they worked just fine for what she was trying to explain. I was eight years old and Saloi was 11 or 12. She took one of the dolls and the teddy bear and began the explanation. This is a man and this is a woman. When they both love each other, they go into their bedroom and they, and they go like this. She put one toy on top of the other. Your mom and your dad do this. And that's why you exist and why your brother does too. I nodded, trying to follow her demonstration. Then she took the two dolls and did the same thing and said, some, some, people do, some people do this instead, that's Mashoha. But my dad said it isn't nice to say that. Mr. Kuntz was a quiet man, but he knew how to take care of people. He and Flor were friends. I'd often see them sipping shimaham together in, in her backyard or in front of his shop. I thought they were in love, so I asked Siloe about it. She slapped me and annoyed, asked if I hadn't understood what she just explained to me with the dolls. But the fact was a doll is a doll, a bear is a bear, and a mashoha is a mashoha. So Louis tried again. Okay, let's see. What do you like more, dolls or cars? Well, it depends on the car and on the doll. So Louis rolled her eyes like she had before. What do you like more, dancing to Shusha or playing tag? I didn't know how to answer that either because everything depended really, and I wasn't and I was having and I was having trouble to understand what she was getting at. Okay, do you like the color pink or the color blue? I like green. For God's sake, this is your last chance. Who do you like more, me or Claudinho? Claudinho was a boy who lived on our street. So Louis thought he was cute. You, of course, I said. Then you want to show her, she said, impatient. Natalia Borges Paleso. The book is Amora. I hope you'll come and join us again and talk about your, your uh, future work. Yeah, invite me and I'll come back. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you're you very much and you're very lovely. Oh, thank you, so are you. <laughs> thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, but in the meantime, resist. resist.